tied up in the bottom of the ninth. Base is loaded.
Good evening, and thank you all for joining us on Road to Space for the launch of the Ariane 5 rocket from the European Space Centre in Kourou, French Guiana. A flight that will be breaking three new records, but we'll tell you more about that later. This evening, we have two passengers on board, SES-17 developed for the operator SES and Syracuse 4A by the French Defence Procurement Agency, both designed by Talis Alenia Space, that are now comfortably installed inside the launcher and, like us, eagerly waiting for liftoff. Well, all the teams are on site, from Ariane Espace, the Kness and ESSA, and currently working on the finer details of the mission. But now my colleague Baptiste is linking up with Stefan Israel in Kourou, and I'll translate for our English-speaking audiences. Good evening, Stefan. Welcome to Road to Space. Very happy to see you tonight for this launch. I see behind you that all the teams are at their stations and ready for this new Ariane 5 launch. What can you tell us about this next mission? This is our 11th launch of the year. We are in the Jupiter Space Room. It's the second with Ariane 5. We will be placing two passengers into geostationary transfer orbit, SES-17, a telecommunication satellite for the operator SES, and Syracuse 4A, a telecommunication satellite developed for the French Def Ministry of Defense. The two passengers, although very different, were manufactured by TELUS Alenia Space. And this will be the 164th and 165th satellites manufactured by TELUS Alenia Space that we put into orbit. But tonight, it is a record-breaking night. VA255 was also set new records. It will be the highest and most powerful Ariane 5 ever operated by Ariane Espace. And above all, with a combined satellite mass of 10,263 kilograms, we will launch the heaviest payload ever placed in geostationary transfer orbit. This is a world record. And now we're going to beat three records tonight. Thank you very much, Stefan. What a program tonight. I see that the pressure is slowly building up, so we won't keep you any longer. Thank you so much, Stefan. Have a fantastic launch. And to help us understand all the finer details of this very special launch, I have with me. The 111th launch of Ariane 5, which will be lifting off shortly from Guiana Spaceport. We will, of course, be live from Kourou, but also here in Paris with our space expert, David Aranzo Gruz, head of Advanced Studies Department at Ariane Espace. With him, we will be reporting step by step the launch, and you will know everything there is to know about these two very special passengers on board. On board the launcher today are two very special passengers, SES-17 and Syracuse 4A. Quand vous avez deux satellites sur le même lancement et donc ils vont partir avec la même fusée Ariane, c'est plus un moment exceptionnel, c'est vraiment une période absolument fantastique. When it comes to telecommunication, surveillance and security satellites, you can't get much better and they are a fine example of French and European know-how. Je me souviendrai toujours du moment où en fait j'ai vu tout le monde en salle blanche venir prêter main forte au reste de l'équipe. Je me souviens du feeling que j'ai ressenti en me disant cette équipe est géniale. We will also be showing you different video reports and never before seen footage of the design of these satellites and giving you the latest update on Ariane Espace's future launcher Ariane 6. Well, it's the 23rd of October 2021. Welcome aboard Road to Space, the program where Earth meets space and the present Thank you everyone for joining us on Road to Space and in less than 30 minutes now, SES-17 and Syracuse 4A will start their journey into space and I'm here with David Aranzo Gruss. You are Head of Advanced Studies Department, Ariane Espace. Can you tell us what was your role in the preparation of this flight? Yes, good evening, Emma. Yes, our role in the Advanced Studies Department is, is way upstream of the launch. About uh, Four years ago, before the launch services contract was signed with our customers, we did the necessary analysis to check the feasibility of the launch and to offer to our customers the best technical solutions. So, to better understand the key phases of this flight, we have a couple of images up, up on our screen, which are coming up in a couple of minutes, that we'd like you to comment on. They should be coming up any minute now. Here we go. Yes, 
So we will be launching from uh, uh, Kourou in the, in the northeastern coast of South America. There will be liftoff. Uh, we will start by ignite, igniting the, the main engine, the Vulcan engine, and then the two solid boosters at seven seconds after H0. This will lift off uh, the launcher. Uh, after that, we will have a vertical climb, and then we will start rotating. Uh, we will perform a gravity turn, progressively tilting uh, the launcher. At uh, two minutes and 19 seconds, we will have booster separation. And uh, shortly after that, in a minute later, we will have the separation of the fairing. This will happen once we have reached a, a high enough altitude so that the, the fairing is no longer needed. The flight will continue towards the east, towards the equator, and at eight minutes uh, after liftoff, eight minutes and 40 seconds, the main engine uh, will cut off uh, and the main stage will separate from the rest of the launcher. The um, upper stage uh, engine will ignite and we will uh, go across the Atlantic for about 15 minutes uh, and then uh, at about 25 uh, minutes, 40 seconds after launch, we will have the shutdown of the engine and uh, the uh, injection uh, in the targeted orbit. A few minutes after that, uh, we will have uh, the uh, separation, the orientation of the upper stage in the right direction and followed by the uh, separation of the SCS-17 uh, satellite, which is the upper passenger in our launcher today. This will happen at uh, 29 minutes after uh, liftoff. After that, we will perform some additional maneuvers to separate the SILDA, the double launch structure, uh, and this will happen at 36 minutes. And a couple of minutes later, after uh, giving the, uh, the satellite the right orientation, we right. will separate Syracuse 4A. After that, uh, the, the stage will continue by uh, performing some passivation maneuvers that will empty the tanks and that will reduce the lifetime in orbit. So what are we seeing here? This is, uh, yes, the end of, the, of well, the maneuvers. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to follow this flight very closely tonight. But before that, we are keeping a close eye on the green panel, which is on the right of the screen, an indispensable piece of information throughout the different phases of the mission. So, David, tell me, what happens if one of the lines or the lights of the panel up there on the screen turn to red? What happens? Yes, indeed, this panel gives real-time information on, on different parameters, the weather conditions, the launch base, the launcher, and all other means that are necessary for the launch, the satellites as well. If one of these lights turns red, it means that there is an anomaly that has been detected and needs to be corrected. And Stefan Israel, we spoke to him earlier on how this launch is a very, very special one. Can you expound on this? I think we're breaking three records tonight. That's right. First of all, performance. The two satellites under the fairing have a combined mass of 10,263 kilos, which is a new uh, world record for a GTO launch. The second is the, the mass of the upper part, including the, the carrying structures, which is uh, more than 11.2 tons. And last but not least, uh, the launcher is the tallest one ever launched, 56.4 meters for Ariane 5. We have added a 1.5 meter racing cylinder under the fairing. So now we're going to be watching a story on SES-17, one of the satellites which is going up today in the Ariane 5 rocket. And we'll find out more about these satellites that will be about to be put into orbit tonight. The SAS-17, SES-17, is a veritable, I love this word, veritable concentrate of technology that we'll find out more about in this new report. That'll be coming up in a few minutes, even a few seconds. SES-17. Six thousand four hundred kilograms of mass and forty-six meters wide, SES-17 is the same height as the Statue of Liberty without its base. This satellite is one of the largest satellites ever launched in space by Ariane Espace. 
Built in Europe by Thales Alenia Space, the satellite will be operated by SES, a global company headquartered in Luxembourg. This spacecraft will travel through space to reach its destination, 36,000 kilometers above our heads. It will be the first fully manned satellite owned by SES in geostationary orbit. A few days ago, one of our journalists met Steve Collar, CEO of SES, to learn more about SES-17. Right, four, three, two, one. SES-17 really represents the most modern of technology. It's huge, it's powerful, uh, but it's also incredibly flexible. I think it's a satellite that is going to change the market for SES and change the market in the Americas. This satellite has one main goal, deliver high-speed connectivity to North and South America, the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean region. Gone are the days of being unreachable when traveling. Nowadays, travelers expect to stay connected at every step of their journey, whether that's at sea or in the air. SES saw a need to build a satellite that would deliver connectivity to where it was demanded most, starting with commercial planes. And to do so, the company from Luxembourg has worked with close partners. But what was unique about SES-17 is, is the fact that not only it involved very, very close work with Thales Alenia Space and Ariane Space, but also with Thales Avionics, a customer for, for the satellite. And so you had this really integrated team approach taking into account the manufacturer, the operator, but also the customers and the end users. During SES-17's construction, more than 1,900 employees were mobilized in the Thales Alenia Space manufacturing facilities. All these partners developed a high-powered satellite that would be able to deliver high-speed internet consistently to air passengers no matter where the planes are, thanks to the Thales in-flight experience. Craig Olson, Vice President of Connectivity Solutions at Thales Avionics, was interviewed by our journalist. Thales in-flight experience really is merging together our capabilities in in-flight entertainment, connectivity, and managed services that can bring a holistic experience to the user, whether it's in terms of having connectivity to their personal device or where our customers have seatback displays um, on board their aircraft and remain connected to their world. Travelers will be able to use the Wi-Fi as if they were at home, HD streaming, playing video games, watching television or posting on social media. And what we're finding is that users want to see that experience that they can enjoy in their living room extend to wherever they go outside their home. And this includes in commercial aircraft space aboard airplanes. The satellite is also able to deliver connectivity services for other applications and markets, such as maritime for commercial shipping and cruise, energy sector for offshore platforms, and mines in remote areas, as well as governments and enterprises across the Americas. The satellite will also bring connectivity to the underserved areas in the region and help accelerate digital inclusion programs. With SES-17, we have the capability to change the lives of uh, populations in Latin America who up to this point have been un unconnected or underconnected. And so what we'll, we're going to be able to do with SES-17 is connect villages, towns and rural populations so that they have the same access to education, to business and to be socially connected. But SES-17 brings even more innovation into space. So there's a really important component on board the spacecraft, which is essentially a very capable router. And what that allows us to do is, is connect every single customer and every single link on board the satellite with every other one. And it, we call it the digital transparent processor. And that's the thing, that's really the heart of this satellite. The DTP will enable high flexibility features such as easy frequency conversions as well as unlimited gateway switching and traffic routing to meet dynamic data demands. SES-17 also has a space brain in its ground system that can automatically allocate the amount and type of connectivity the application will require, bringing even more flexibility to the satellite. This space brain can also be connected to SES's next generation satellites operating in a different orbit, making it the first of its kind in the world. In just a few minutes, SES-17 will leave for its great journey to space on board the Ariane 5 rocket. 
and in a few months, the satellite will be ready to connect communities and businesses across the Americas. Well, we've learned that in this report that SES-17 is the most modern of technology. It's game-changing. But, David, more than that, we know that SES-17 is equipped with a system that is unique in the world. And that will be put into orbit tonight for the first time. And you know it more than I do, the MPL, Mechanically Pumped Loop. So this is an active thermal control system developed by Thales Alenia Space with ESA and Kines, which allows the heat generated by the satellite's equipment to be evacuated to the cold zones and then into space. So David, what is the advantage of this system? Yes, Emma, so one of the difficulties of space is, is managing the temperature because you have extreme variations depending on whether you are facing the sun or not. Mm -hmm. So with this new innovative system, SES-17 is able to better manage this temperature, allowing it to integrate more powerful equipment which dissipates more heat. So the, the super powerful payloads we are launching tonight are possible thanks to this system. And SES, we learnt as well, weighs in at six tons. It is the first NEO weighing in at over four tons launched by Arinus Bass. NEO, sorry. What modification did you have to carry out to ensure that the launch was able to carry out this mission? Yes, the, the satellite is the, the largest one of the space bus NEO family to be launched by Arinus Space. With, but uh, not only it's a heavy bird, but it's also a large one in terms of volume. So in order to have enough volume, we are using the short version of the SILDA structure, which is less than five meters. And uh, the satellite itself has been designed to, fill, to fit perfectly inside this, uh, this volume. Okay, well tonight, a second satellite will be sent into orbit. It is called Syracuse 4A. Syracuse 4A is a concentrate of technical, technological, sorry, it's very late here, innovations and was developed by the French Defence Procurement Agency and manufactured by Thales Alenia Space. It inaugurates the new generation of Syracuse constellations, which is being built to secure jamming resistant military communications between the different military units on land, in the air and at sea and with the command centre. And in a couple of seconds, we will be watching a report on this absolutely amazing satellite, Syracuse 4. So um, let's find out more in this report coming up now. Observing, listening, communicating, moving, fighting. Satellites are essential for the conduct of military operations. Operating in space is vital. Today, with the advent of Syracuse 4A, a new page in history is being written for the French Ministry for the Armed Forces and Military Space Telecommunications. Developed by the French Defence Procurement Agency in conjunction with the National Centre for Space Studies and by Thales Alenia Space and Airbus Defence and Space, Syracuse 4A is the first military telecommunications satellite and part of a new constellation of three satellites. Its role? To connect different military units in all weathers, whether on land, at sea or in the air, on a daily basis and while on the move. Operations are often in locations where no secure and reliable communications infrastructure exists, such as in the East or in the Sahel region. To act efficiently, the forces of the army need to prepare their action. So they need to plan the operation. Ensuite, elles doivent conduire l'opération et enfin évaluer l'efficacité de leur action. Toutes ces activités nécessitent des communications permanentes et fiables et seules les télécommunications spatiales apportent cela. Syracuse constitue le noyau dur des télécommunications spatiales, c'est-à-dire un système de communication sécurisé, maîtrisé par les forces armées et durci contre les agressions extérieures. Et les atouts majeurs de la quatrième génération de Syracuse sont l'augmentation des débits atteignables, une connectivité et une flexibilité de la charge utile qui permet d'adapter les débits, les zones de couverture, les services au profit des forces armées. To accompany the satellite, the French Defence Procurement Agency has begun the upgrade of its ground segment. From Earth, it will be able to control satellites and ensure secure communications. Syracuse 4A will enable the majority of naval vessels and armoured vehicles to connect while on the move. Even certain aircraft such as the Griffin, a new French armoured vehicle, the Soufren, a French submarine, or the Phoenix, a new French Airbus. Once connected, they will be far more effective. 
For the construction of Syracuse 4A, the French Defense Procurement Agency contracted Thales Alenia Space. For the last 30 years, this industrial group, based in Cannes in the south of France, with sites in Toulouse and in Europe, has been building satellites for the French government. Syracuse 4A is, above all, a fine example of French know-how. It embodies the high level of expertise of French governmental and industrial players in the space field, guaranteeing the country's independence. More than 400 people have been working on its design and construction for several years now. Teles Alenia Space also teamed up with Airbus Defence and Space, who in turn worked with more than 40 other subcontractors throughout France. A concentrate of innovations, Syracuse 4A will provide connectivity up to three times higher than its predecessors, thanks to two frequency bands. Le système Syracuse est innovant, notamment pour sa composante spatiale, puisque les satellites Syracuse 4 embarquent deux innovations majeures. La première, c'est l'utilisation de la propulsion électrique. Donc on utilise des moteurs à plasma pour ces satellites-là. Moteurs à plasma qui sont issus d'une filière française et qui nous permettent d'embarquer de, une charge utile beaucoup plus performante parce qu'ils sont plus légers, plus compacts et donc on a de meilleurs résultats en orbite. La deuxième innovation, c'est l'utilisation d'un processeur numérique embarqué qui autorise une charge utile beaucoup plus flexible en termes de communication et donc une souplesse d'emploi pour le client final opérationnel. Syracuse 4A also has the capacity to deal with military attacks by using anti-jam technology. In an environment where threats are diversifying and intensifying, access to and use of space must be preserved to guarantee France's sovereignty. Le président de la République a souhaité doter la France d'une véritable stratégie spatiale de défense. This is the aim of the new space defense strategy requested by France's president. A strategy that has given rise to Space Command, created in 2019 within the Air Force and the Space Ministry, and also to the Space Control Armament Program, dedicated to space surveillance and satellite defense systems, all headed by the French Defense Procurement Agency. In a few minutes, Syracuse 4A will be launched aboard Ariane 5, this satellite will provide armed forces with next-generation secure command links. The Syracuse 4 constellation will be progressively completed with the arrival of Syracuse 4B by 2023 and Syracuse 4C responding to the armed forces' need for connectivity. We've just been watching the report on Syracuse 4A, David. And it doesn't look like a very small satellite to me. How does it fit under the short silder which you mentioned earlier? Well, what we have done is we have added a 1.5 meter racing cylinder under the fairing and the silder. In this way, we have increased the volume of Syracuse uh, for the volume for Syracuse 4A. And uh, at the same time, by using the short version of the silda, as I mentioned before, the, the volume available for the top position is sufficient for SES 17. So this shows the flexibility of the Ariane system to adapt to different customers. So Syracuse 4A and SES 17, they both are using electric propulsion to reach their operational geostationary position. But what does this mean for the launcher, David, then? So, yes, Emma, the, in fact, considering the, the high mass of the passengers today, the orbit targeted will not be a standard geostationary orbit, but an orbit with a slightly lower apogee altitude. This will not have a, a significant impact on the satellites in particular because they are using electrical propulsion. This is a highly efficient propulsion, meaning that the amount of propellant needed is much lower than with classical chemical propulsion. But to, ins to really answer your question, on the launcher side, uh, this adds additional flexibility because the satellite is able to adapt to different orbits. And um, I had another question for you. It's why is the liftoff scheduled so late, 10.01 local time in Karoo? Why did you opt for a late evening launch? Yes, in fact, it's, uh, the electrical satellites need to have direct sunlight as soon as possible after the separation from the launcher uh, in order to have energy as soon as possible to use their propulsion system. Therefore, with a launch at 10 p.m. local time in Kourou, they will be receiving the morning sunlight when they separate above the Indian Ocean. Okay, well that's clear for me. Well, in a few minutes, Syracuse 4A and SES-17 
As we say, we'll take off into space on board Ariane 5 to reach their final destination. Yes, David, some 36,000 kilometers above our heads. The launcher, however, began its preparation campaign journey on the 2nd of September. We have some footage of the campaign, and David, I'd like you to talk it through with us. We have some edited images, which are going to be coming up on our screen in the next 10 seconds or so. And here we go. Yes, so the launcher arrived in, in Kourou by boat, crossing the Atlantic. Uh, uh, it took about two weeks to cross the Atlantic. Once uh, at the harbor in Kourou, it was uh, transported on these big containers uh, on the road uh, and uh, up to the launcher assembly building that you see here, uh, where the team Safarian group uh, started the assembly. Uh, you see here the main cryogenic stage with the Vulcan engine and it is uh, lifted out of its uh, transport container, uh, lifted on top of the building and uh, then uh, it is integrated on top of the two solid boosters, boosters that you see here coming out of their preparation building and uh, being transported into the uh, launcher assembly building. You will see the two uh, boosters here uh, coming into uh, the second one coming into the building. And once this uh, lower part is integrated, then we have the upper stage that you see here that is put on top of the of the launcher. Once the launcher is completed, there is a series of tests, electrical tests, uh, fluidic tests that are performed to make sure that everything is good. After that, the launcher comes out of the launcher assembly building and moves a few hundred meters uh, to the final assembly building that you see on the left, uh, where the uh, satellites are waiting to hop on the launcher. The satellites have been prepared uh, in parallel and uh, they are integrated with the fairing that you see here and then everything is put on top of the launcher. Uh, once this is done, the, the launcher is ready, and so the day before the launch, uh, the, the launcher comes out of the final assembly building and is pushed uh, uh, into uh, the launch zone uh, where the, the countdown starts. So it's not only the launchers have made this long journey, these satellites have also made a long journey to get there. SCS-17 left the clean rooms of the Talas Alenia space site in Cannes back on, when was it, David, the 22nd of September? It right. has now been on the Guiana Space Center for a month with its companion, Syracuse 4A. And I'd like to remind you all at home that Syracuse 4A is a military telecommunication satellite. Now, I'm just wondering, David, what about the security conditions? Are they reinforced when launching a military satellite? And what are the ramifications for the launch pad in Kourou? Can you talk to us about that? Yes, Emma. So uh, at the Guiana Space Center, there are, of course, uh, stringent security measures. And it is even more the case in for sensitive government uh, satellites, as it is the case today. So the satellites are continuously monitored by the customers. They are in limited access zones at all times. And, uh, of course, as usual, the, 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 the Space Center is closely guarded by the French military on the ground, at sea, and in the air, and in particular as we get closer to the launch. And yes, and we are very close to the launch. We're only a few minutes away from liftoff. So what is happening to the satellites at this time? What are they up to? Are they being looked after? Yes. Uh, they now, have a nanny. <laughs> yes, uh, a few minutes before launch, the satellites are sitting comfortably on, on top of the launcher. They are, uh, the satellites uh, need to keep uh, temperatures within certain limits uh, for their systems to work correctly once in orbit, the propellants, the batteries. So we are uh, now making sure that uh, all these conditions are, are ready for launch. So now we're waiting for, thank you very much, David, for that explanation. Now we're waiting for the confirmation of the synchronized sequence from the DDO. The DDO is the Director of Operations in Kourou. Why, why do we need this announcement? It's, a, it's an important announcement, announcement because it, uh, it uh, indicates the start of uh, some important operations just before launch. Oh, we can hear him. We can hear him in the background. Right. We just had the confirmation. Just had the confirmation. 
set seven okay. minutes. We've just had the confirmation. So we've just heard from the DDO, Director of Operations in Kourou. He has just confirmed the start of the synchronized sequence. Now, how exciting is that? David, can you explain to us what this means and why this moment well, you're going to explain to me again why this moment is so important. Yes, yes. It's the start of the last operations before launch, meaning that if for some reason the, the countdown stops, we have to come back to this uh, H0 minus 7 minute mark. So at this point, the, the final operations are performed. Uh, for example, we are uh, pressurizing the tanks to the final pressure that uh, is needed for flight. The, we are closing all the, the filling lines. And in a few minutes, uh, just a few minutes before launch, uh, the, the control of the operations will be handed over to the launcher onboard computer who will control the last events, uh, including the ignition and the engine, uh, the ignition of the engines uh, for liftoff. So everything is controlled from this, the Jupiter Control Center, or as I, I know it's called, the fishbowl, where all the operators are focused on the job at hand. But how would you describe the atmosphere in the control room at this stage of the operations, only minutes away from, from our launch? Yeah, right now everyone is obviously uh, fully focused on, on what they're doing. It's, uh, it's now up to the launcher uh, to confirm that uh, all the parameters are expected and uh, the green panel is closely monitored and uh, yes indeed we see that there is a, a red light on what the, can, uh, can you t can you tell us exactly on the right hand side on the green panel there's a there's a red um, come up what does that mean yeah so it's a red on the uh, launch uh, launch zone uh, so uh, we will check what does that imply then it means that there is some thing that is not Technical as expected uh, and so yes we have for the time being uh, a red light for the launch but again we have a, a very large we have a very large window today so we will check what the anomaly is and come back as soon as uh, well, while they're working that out i just wanted to ask you a bit about the jupiter run we can hear the ddo in the background it was um ignore ign ign inaugurated sorry it is very late for us here in paris in 1996 during ariane's 82nd launch it's built like an amphitheater the public is seated around a wall which projects images enabling people to experience the launch live can you talk to us about that i'm sure you've been there and and, and felt it and yes you're right the, the jupiter room is indeed a, a very good place to watch the launch uh, people can walk outside <clears throat> to see the launch uh, live and then all the screens in the control room uh, provide the launcher parameters during during the, the ascent. And uh, yes, in this room, besides the, the, the general public who is invited to the launch, there is uh, um, there is all the launcher authorities who are there from CNES, ESA, Ariane Space, as well as all our customers. So can we go back to this green panel, which unfortunately now there are two reds. Can you go through that again with us, please? Can you t take us through it and tell us what, what this means? Yes, yeah, so, so the top line, yes, is the, the launch, uh, the go for launch, the authorization for launch, um, which is, I would say, uh, is green when everything else is green. So right now, this, is, this explains what, why it is red. So we, here mm -hmm. we have on the left-hand side the launch base, the logistics, the safety, uh, the telemetry uh, data uh, and the telecommunications with the different uh, parts uh, and the different centers that need to communicate during the launch. And then on the right hand side we have, uh, yes, the launch zone, uh, which is the one that is right right now, the launcher, the satellites and the weather, which is also an important parameter. So we now see that the uh, countdown has stopped that there are two red lights. So we're going to leave you for the moment and then come back when we find out what has gone on. And um, we will be back with you shortly. So for this very, very special flight, we just need some time for the technical teams in Kuru to find out what the problem is. See you soon. See you then. Bye-bye.
Well, we're now back on air. Welcome back to Road to Space. It is four o'clock in the morning here in Paris. Um, David, well, we're going to be restarting. Let's talk about that green panel, which was red before we, uh, when we left before, and now it's completely green. Can you tell us? This is really good news. But do you have any more information about the, the, the red line we saw before? Yes, so the, there was, uh, there was uh, an information of one of the uh, pressure readings uh, of the main stage of the launcher that was a bit unusual. So, uh, of course, we decided to, to stop and uh, to check uh, and, and, and to check that everything was, uh, was okay. We, there were some additional tests performed and uh, the tests were uh, okay. So uh, we decided to, to continue. So here we hear the DDO. He's about to confirm the synchronized sequence. We're at seven minutes. That's right. It's not, he's, he hasn't said anything, but he, he sounds like he's about to. This is very exciting, David. Yes, he should announce shortly the restart at H0 minus seven minutes. That's right. We did see the panel was completely green, that's which is correct. such good news. We don't want to risk a second red, that's for sure. So what do, we're looking now, we're looking at the DDO on the left hand. Yes, it should we're be a just few about to. We're just about to um, have confirmed the synchronized sequence by the DDO. We can see him there on the left hand side of our screen with the glasses and his mask, of course, the director of operations in Kuru. And we are waiting for him to restart the launch synchronization at minus seven minutes. And yes, we just got the confirmation right now. He just announced the H0 minus seven minutes and therefore the launch time Brilliant. will be... Uh, at what time? We will be at uh, 4.10 uh, uh, here in Paris, meaning uh, 2.10 uh, universal time. So now we see the countdown has started. We are at six minutes, 26 seconds. So this is a very, very important moment, David. We're about, it, the Ariane 5 is about to launch. Can you explain to us why this moment is so important, this, this synchronized, synchronized sequence? Sorry, it's very late here. Yes, yes, uh, the, the synchronized sequence is indeed a very important moment in this, in this countdown. This is uh, when we perform all the, la all the last operations uh, prior to launch. Um, and uh, including, okay, the, the pressurization of the tanks, the closing of some of the, of the valves, the, the switching on of some elements, and uh, again, in a few minutes, the, the control of the operations will be uh, handed over to the launcher, uh, to its computer, and, and it will control the, the end of the operations before liftoff. Up, including the, the, the ignition of the engines. So now we can see on the right-hand side of the screen, the panel is still green. What are we waiting for now? Uh, again, this is uh, just the, the last operations that are done uh, automatically, uh, uh, both by the ground systems and by the launcher to, to check that all the parameters are, are okay. So everything is controlled from this, the Jupiter Control Center, which we see up on the screen, they're all there. They all look very serious, where all the operators are very focused on the job at hand. How would you describe the atmosphere, David, in the control room at this stage of the operations at four minutes, 52 seconds from liftoff? Yes, everyone is, is concentrated, focused on what they're doing and, uh, uh, okay, checking that all the parameters are okay and, okay, waiting uh, for, for the last moments, hoping that, okay, there will be no red light coming up. So we just saw um, in the Jupiter Control Center uh, quite a few people there. There's a public seated around a wall in like an amphitheater, um, which enables them to experience this launch live. Who are these people? Yes, so we have, yes, uh, the, some general public who is invited to, to attend the, 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 the launch. Uh, and then, of course, all the launcher authorities uh, from CNES, Sarian Space, and, of course, uh, our customers. 
So um, what I didn't say earlier was this, the Jupiter Room was inaugurated in 1996 during Ariane's 82nd launch. But that's not the only building. The, another important one is the CDL number no. three, which is partially shielded and is located 2.5 kilometers from the launcher. And this is, in fact, where um, we found where the red um, button came from because somebody had... Um, sounded it from there. Is that not right? Can you talk to us about the CDL building? Yes, uh, you're right. The, the operations are, are monitored uh, from this uh, launch control center, the CDL-3, which is, yes, a bunker located just a couple of kilometers from the launcher. And uh, in this uh, building, we have the operational, the engineering, and the quality teams that are monitoring all the parameters. Uh, and yes, this is where any event can be detected. So thank God for the CDL Center because otherwise we wouldn't have known about that tonight. So um, what I want to ask you next is, so when you were on mission and you, you, you're working over there in Karoo, um, where do you work from? Is it from the CDL building or from the Jupiter Control Center? Can you talk to us about that? Yes, uh, yes, uh, I've, uh, I've been uh, several times uh, working there uh, in the CDL3, so in the, the launch control center in where the, as, uh, as part of the engineering uh, support team, uh, so following all the, all the activities, all the com launcher integration campaigns, and, and then following the chronology and uh, supporting uh, for the, the management of any, anything that may come up. And recently, on the years that you've been working for Ariane Espas, have you experienced a, a red day? <laughs> uh, well, th there is always a possibility, mainly on, on the weather, to, to have a, a, red, uh, a red light at some point. But uh, no, I must say that uh, the missions I have worked on have been quite smooth. So we are now at 1 minute 54, 1 minute 54 seconds from the launch. Um, and then, we, obviously, the DDO will be um, um, launching the countdown again. How do you feel, how does one feel being in that the fishbowl and feeling that excitement? They all look very concentrated. I don't know what kind of emotions one is going through at that stage. Yes, it's, it's a very intense moment uh, right now because, uh, yeah, okay, we are very, very close to, to the launch and uh, uh, the, there is a very high degree of... Uh, Emotion going into this into this moment and concentration, just uh, waiting for for the launch. À tous de DDO. So now Attention the DDO is saying that in now six, five, four, three, two, one, he's now top. going to give us the top for liftoff. So we are now only a few seconds away from liftoff, which we have all been eagerly awaiting for since the beginning of the program. David, anything else you'd like to add? Any last encouraging words? Yes, go Ariane 5. Well, fair wind to the launcher 5115. Let's now admire these incredible images. We'll, of course, stop our live commentary to sit back and enjoy the 111th launch of Ariane 5. Attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Top allumage moteur Vulcain. Allumage des deux EAP et décollage VA255, S17 et Syracuse 4A. The Ariane 5 the launcher has nominal. just successfully completed its liftoff, but the mission the is not over yet, is it, David? 
Other no. equally important steps are still to come. These include the separation of the two satellites on board, Syracuse 4A and SES-17, which should reach their geostationary position in about 30 minutes. Is that correct, David? I'm so happy. Yes, that's right. That's right. David, you are also connected with Kuruvir and Earpiece, where the CVI transmits all the information concerning the evolution of the emission. What is the CVI and, and how does it work? Yes, uh, I have a, a direct link with the CVI team, uh, a team located in Kourou, who receives the real-time flight data sent by the launcher to the tracking stations. And uh, right now they confirm that all the parameters are, are as expected. These parameters include the altitude, the velocity, the engine parameters. So at two minutes, 19 seconds from liftoff, the CVI should announce, am I right, the separation of the boosters? Is that the first thing? Yes, How that's right. How important is this step for the mission, David? Yes, in a few seconds, the, the booster separation should take place. The uh, launcher will have gone through most through the most stressful part of the launch. Stressful. In, yes, yeah. in terms of mechanical loads, dynamic pressure, and the booster separation will be at around 65 kilometers and traveling at the speed of max 6.5. So it should come up in just a few seconds. So a few seconds, in three seconds. Yep, we've seen it now. Yes, we have the confirmation Brilliant. of the separation, yes. Okay. So this stage is the first of many, and in a few seconds, Ariane will be at an altitude of 110 kilometers, and the DDO will then be announcing the separation of the fairing. What can you tell us about this particular stage, David? Yes, yeah, so at 110 kilometer altitude, the atmosphere has become really thin, only a few where particles remain. So at this point, the fairing, which is there to protect the satellites the from the atmosphere, the heat and the sound that lift off, and during the ascent is no longer needed. So it is jettisoned to, to save weight. So this again should uh, happen in just about 10 seconds. This is an important moment as well. Well, every stage is important, every phase. We're just waiting now. A couple of seconds for the separation of the fairing. 318, there we go. We just have seen it. We've seen it on the screen. And so we have the confirmation from confirmation. the video Brilliant. as well. So by separating from its fairing, Ariane 5 Watt will now be approximately two tons lighter, which is a significant weight in flight. SES-17, one of the two satellites launched tonight, had a launch mass of more than six tons, and it is one of the ten heaviest telecommunication satellites launched by Ariane Espace since its creation. Am I correct, David? Yes, that's right, yes. So at this stage of the launch, we have a launcher that weighs what and is traveling at what speed? We can see it up on the screen, I think. Can you tell us? Well, in terms of mass, the launcher was about 780 tons at liftoff. Right now, we have only about 149 tons left. And the speed, as you can see, yes, it's about 2.7 kilometers per second, uh, which is about a third of what we need to reach. At the end of the flight, we will be about 9.3 kilometers per second. So now up on... The We've got Ariane Sank up there. Can you talk to us about the images we're seeing up here? Yes, so you, so you have the, the, the launcher as it is right now with the main stage and then on top the, the upper stage and the, and the two satellites uh, on the right-hand side. And on the right you see, yes, the different parameters, the altitude of the launcher and then the, the ground track uh, with the uh, projector that it will follow uh, along along. Crossing, crossing the ocean and then Africa. Could I just ask you, what will the next launch Ariane 6 bring in terms of adaptability? Well, it would bring a much larger fairing size and uh, that will help to, to launch any two large communication satellites. And also we will have a reignitable upper stage which will also allow to deploy satellites in different, uh, in different orbits. So, David, in our previous program, Road to Space, we gave you an update on the new heavy launch vehicle Ariane 6 and the state-of-the-art custom-built launch pad that was being prepared to receive the new launcher. Well, unbelievably, it was inaugurated, inaugurated a few weeks ago in Kourou. And um, we now have a, a video coming up, a report we've done with our teams. 
and we'd like you to take a look. This is coming up in the next 15 seconds. Next Tech. Have you been to the new launch pad? Yes, it's indeed quite amazing, yes. It's coming up now. Next Tech. Acquisition de la télémesure par la station de Natal. Fifty-five thousand cubic meters of concrete, nine hundred thousand cubic meters of earthwork, eight thousand cubic meters of structural steel. Some six hundred people worked on the site of what is Guiana Space Center's ninth new launch complex, which was inaugurated on the twenty-eighth of September. Built by the Kness and its industrial partners in French Guiana, the Ella 4 pad will welcome Europe's upcoming Ariane 6 rocket. Ella 4 is made up of the launch pad, which is the base that supports the launcher itself, all structures and equipment necessary for final assembly operations, the launch table that is embedded in it, the mobile gantry and the umbilical mast. The new CSG launch pad is what you'd call state of the art. Central to its design, two important objectives, to reduce launch costs achieved by integrating the launcher horizontally and automating operations. The second objective was the environmental aspect, archaeological excavations, a wildlife inventory, and to cede 1,336 hectares of land to the Conservatoire du Littoral to offset constructions. As for infrastructures, the LF4 complex will significantly minimize the use of air conditioning and therefore energy consumption during operations. We will, of course, come back to you to talk about this ninth launch zone, which will shortly welcome Ariane 6. But for the moment, let's continue to follow the progression of Ariane 5 on its 111th mission. The DDO, Head of Operations in Kourou, has just announced the acquisition of the natal station. David, you have been our export throughout this program in Road to Space since the beginning of the mission. Can you talk to us a bit more about this stage of the flight, which is as crucial as the first? Yes, yeah, so the, the, right now the main stage is uh, in the last seconds of, uh, of its job. It's, uh, the main engine will shut down in, in a few seconds and the stage will be separated. And uh, after that, there will be the, the ignition of the upper stage engine. So it should come up in a few seconds. And um, the yes. shutdown must be now. The upper stage? There we go. There we, we go. There we go. Yeah. Extinction okay. moteur Vulcan. DDO is just telling us that. Yes, we have. Separation de l'étage principal cryotechnique. We have the confirmation of the separation and we have the confirmation. Allumage de l'étage et du moteur. As well of the ignition of the upper stage engine. So what does that all mean? Well, it means that everything is going as expected. It's, it's good news. And uh, in the meantime, we have also uh, heard that uh, we had acquired the, the Natal tracking station, which is in Brazil. And uh, so for the time being, everything is good. So, um, sorry, um, so we don't see the launcher anymore? No, well... For the time being, in fact, uh, we are still uh, being uh, tracked both from the Gallia station, uh, in, which is right next to the launch site, and from the Natal station in Brazil. But uh, yes, the visibility from the Gallia station should be lost in a few seconds. So sorry, can you just take us through those steps again? What will be happening next? We're at now 10 minutes 11 after the launch. Yes, so, um, so we're tracking on the map. If we yeah, see on the map, right now on the right. we can see we can see on the map that we are uh, north of uh, we're, the Brazil. We're before uh, the loss of natal, which is yes. La propulsion est nominale et And le pilotage uh, est calme. we see that the, the launcher is basically flying horizontally. It's increasing its speed. Going towards it's maybe, the east. Uh, yeah, it's even going down a little bit to gain some speed. 
and it's going across the Atlantic at uh, very quickly at 7.2 kilometers per second. Um, We're now one minute away from the loss of natal. Yes. What does that mean? What does that mean for Ariane 5? Well, it means that, uh, yes, in a, f in a few uh, seconds, uh, we should be too far uh, to be visible from the tracking station in Natal in Brazil. So we will have uh, a short period during which the launcher will not be tracked by the ground stations. Um, but this is not a problem because the, the launcher has a, like a hard drive where it can store uh, the data and uh, and then it will download it when we reach the following uh, tracking station which is uh, in the ascension island in the middle of the atlantic so for example will the ddo be telling us all of this at 11:53 in 10 seconds time is he the person who uh, yes the, he should be telling that uh, to us uh, of course these are the, the theoretical times uh, Sometimes the, 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 the tracking is better than expected, meaning that uh, we may not lose it at the time that is expected. We, we can lose it a bit later on. I'm just being told in my earpiece that in a couple of seconds we will be seeing that launch. Here we go. I think we're going to be seeing the trajectoire it. Est nominal. Oh, no. He's just announcing exactly what you said. But as you see, on the left-hand side of our screen is the launch. Can we go through it again? Right. Can you, can you yes. talk so, us through it? Yes, you, we, we saw there the, the ignition of the Vulcan engine. Uh, the, this engine was checked right after its ignition, and once everything was uh, uh, checked to be, to be normal, then the ignition of the boosters uh, took place. Once the boosters are ignited, uh, there is nothing that can hold the launcher down. So we lift it off with, uh, with uh, a large thrust, more than 1,500 tons, mainly from the boosters. In about 20 minutes, Ariane 5 will place the two satellites, SES-17 and Syracuse-4, into geostationary orbit. It's been a long journey from the clean rooms of Thales Alenia Space in Cannes, where we went to meet Kevin and Patrice on the Thales site. They both worked on the design and construction of these technological gems. Let's hear what they have to say. This is today's space work, a report for Road to Space, which is coming up now. Je m'appelle Kevin, j'ai 32 ans et je suis responsable satellite en IT et je suis chez Thales Alenia Space depuis 2016. Je m'appelle Patrice, j'ai 52 ans, je travaille chez Thales Alenia Space depuis 28 ans et j'occupe actuellement le poste d'architecte satellite. C'est croisé euh, en Guyane, mais euh, voilà, on n'a pas vraiment. Ça, c'est une des premières fois où on a discuté ensemble. Je travaille avec son alter ego, mais sur Syracuse, mais pas, pas en direct avec toi. Hein, Exactement, ouais. Responsable satellite en IT, on est responsable du satellite dans la phase finale. On termine d'assembler les derniers morceaux, on intègre les derniers éléments et on teste le satellite pour vérifier qu'il fonctionne bien. Et tout ça, ça se passe en salle blanche dans une zone euh, du, du bâtiment qui est plus propre qu'à l'ordinaire pour euh, protéger le satellite euh, de poussière, etc. On essaye de s'imaginer tout ce que le satellite va traverser. On va faire vibrer le satellite exactement comme il vibre dans le lanceur. Après, il va être dans l'espace, il va y avoir des grosses contraintes de température. Donc du coup, on va faire pareil. J'interviens surtout dans vraiment dans toute la phase de, de vie du satellite. L Architecte, bon, on peut faire le parallèle comme une maison. Hein. La maison, c'est le satellite. Donc mon métier consiste à animer, coordonner une équipe d'ingénieurs qui sont chacun spécialisés dans des domaines bien différents. Donc on va démarrer dès la, la phase de conception du satellite. On va donc le, le designer. Oui, puisque en fait, quand vous avez fait les plans et justifié que la maison, elle tient, après nous, on la construit. Quoi. Voilà. En gros, c'est ça. Et après, ça va être l'assemblage, l'intégration de tous ces éléments. Et donc moi, je vais te spécifier les tests et les misères que je vais faire subir au satellite. <rire> euh, tu vas donc demander à tes équipes de préparer ces tests, les réaliser. Et moi, de mon côté, je vais analyser toutes les, les données pour pouvoir déclarer le, le satellite à la fin aptovol. Depuis que je suis tout petit, euh... Je rêve d'espace, j'ai toujours trouvé ça exceptionnel de, de travailler sur des produits, je pense que Patrice c'est pareil, qui vont être à des dizaines de milliers de kilomètres de la, de la Terre. 
j'ai réalisé mon rêve d'enfant. Oui. Adolescent, euh, j'avais déjà un peu la tête dans les étoiles. Alors je rêvais un peu en classe. Je me revois encore euh, en train de réaliser la première maquette euh, de la navette spatiale Columbia. C'est plutôt à la fin de mes études, pendant mon stage, que j'ai vraiment mis le, le pied dans, dans le monde du spatial. J'ai trouvé ma vocation. Le dernier programme sur lequel j'ai travaillé est le programme Syracuse 4. On va pouvoir assurer les communications entre les militaires sur un théâtre d'opération qui puisse gérer, communiquer avec la métropole en France. Donc c'est grâce à notre produit que nos militaires arrivent à s'organiser et à communiquer. Le satellite SES-17 porte trois innovations majeures. Qui dit innovation dans le spatial, je pense que Patrice sera, sera d'accord. Euh, innovation dans le spatial, c'est toujours difficile. Quand on justifie que le satellite va bien fonctionner, on justifie qu'il va bien fonctionner pendant 15 ans euh, dans l'espace sans que personne ne puisse le réparer. Donc euh, dès qu'on met une innovation, ça veut dire que personne n'a jamais utilisé euh, euh, le système nouveau. Et donc on doit démontrer euh, tant bien que mal que, euh, que tout va bien se passer. Syracuse 4, ah ben c'est très récent. J'ai passé un mois en campagne euh, à Kourou, sans savoir, euh, dans ma chambre d'hôtel. J'ai vécu avec, pendant 15 jours avec euh, une araignée la plus dangereuse au monde. Voilà, on vit dangereusement dans ce métier aussi. Je pensais être dans ma petite chambre climatisée et, et en fait non, je, je vivais avec un, un monstre. C'était sur SES 17, je me souviens que c'était un vendredi où euh, c'était une période difficile où l'équipe était fatiguée, etc. On a eu un, un problème particulièrement contraignant à gérer sur le satellite. Et étant donné que c'était le vendredi après-midi, je m'attendais vraiment à ce qu'on soit quand même peu à devoir résoudre le problème. Je me souviendrai toujours du moment où en fait, j'ai vu tout le monde en salle blanche, des gens qui n'étaient pas du tout censés être là, venir prêter main forte au reste de l'équipe. Je me souviens du, du, du feeling que j'ai ressenti en me disant « cette équipe est géniale » parce que c'est ce genre de choses qui, qui a fait la différence sur le satellite et c'est une des raisons pour lesquelles on devrait lancer la fusée à l'heure avec Syracuse. Moi, je suis sûr que c'est un métier qui a de l'avenir. Parce que euh, quand on se sert de satellite pour mieux naviguer sur la, sur la Terre, quand on est dans la voiture et qu'on sait où est-ce qu'on va, c'est euh, de temps en temps grâce à des satellites. Je, je le précise, le motto de Thales Alenia Space, c'est Space for Life. Le message qu'il y a derrière, c'est clairement que euh, il y a énormément de choses euh, dans l'espace qui nous servent à la vie de tous les jours. Clairement, ça a de l'avenir. On le voit dans les actualités, hein. on veut revenir, euh, retourner sur la Lune et puis demain mars, ça, ça fera toujours rêver et moi je continuerai toujours à rêver. They have what you might call, they have what you might call a dream job, certainly these are the jobs of the future. That's the message we get from this report. But meanwhile, the rocket is continuing its trajectory. Um, we now have um, confirmation from the DDO that uh, the launch has established contact with Libreville. Can you um, confirm that to me, David? Yes, that's right. Yes, we, we are. Everything is going as expected. We are getting closer to the end of the upper stage uh, propulsive phase. So this Ariane 5 flight with these two Thales Alenia space satellites aboard is a unique moment for the leader in satellite systems. Hervé Deré, CEO of the French company, is going to explain to us why. Let's take a look at this new report we have to offer you, open source, with the CEO, Henry Deré, Hervé Deré, pardon. Bonjour, on est chez Thales Alenia Space. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous expliquer le rôle de votre entreprise Thales Alenia Space, c'est un des grands leaders dans le domaine du, des systèmes satellitaires. Et c'est une joint venture entre deux groupes de l'Aerospace and Defense, Thales d'un côté et Leonardo de l'autre. Et on est réparti sur 17 sites, principalement en Europe, mais également euh, aux états unis Mais il y a une autre joint venture, qui est un peu la, la petite sœur de, de Thales Alenia Space, qui s'appelle Telespadio, qui elle est focalisée sur les services. 
Et en fait, la combinaison des deux forme ce qu'on appelle la Space Alliance, et ce qui nous permet en fait de répondre aux besoins croissants dans le domaine des applications hein, de, des, des systèmes satellitaires, et donc d'accompagner nos clients avec la combinaison de ces deux offres, systèmes satellitaires et services. Et en fait, ces systèmes, ils contribuent à la vie de tous les jours et ils préparent l'avenir. On est là ce soir pour parler du lancement VA255. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous expliquer pourquoi c'est un lancement important pour Thales Alenia Space Dans la vie d'un satellite ou dans la vie de son développement, le, le lancement est toujours un moment absolument exceptionnel. Alors quand vous avez deux satellites sur le même lancement et donc ils vont partir avec la même fusée Ariane, ce n'est plus un moment exceptionnel, c'est vraiment une période absolument fantastique. Donc on est dans ce moment vraiment unique pour, pour nos équipes et on est évidemment impatient de voir ce, ce lancement s'effectuer. Donc ce soir, il y a deux passagers à bord. Il y a notamment euh, SES-17, satellite de communication. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire un mot sur les défis euh, techniques dans la construction de ce satellite Alors, ce satellite, euh, SES-17, c'est finalement le programme le plus ambitieux de Thales Ania Space dans le domaine des satellites géostationnaires depuis, euh, depuis quelques années. Euh, pourquoi il est très ambitieux D'abord, euh, en commençant par la plateforme. Donc c'est une plateforme qu'on appelle Spacebus Neo, dans notre, euh, dans notre jargon euh, interne. Et c'est une plateforme entièrement électrique. Alors au passage, d'ailleurs, c'est la même plateforme qui est utilisée aussi sur Syracuse 4 hein, et qui permet d'emporter avec elle une charge utile, donc euh, la, la charge qui, qui vraiment euh, prend en compte la mission de télécommunication, ultra capacitive. Donc il va avoir un, une très grosse performance et vous pouvoir offrir des très grands débits. Si on avait utilisé des technos anciennes, il aurait fallu plusieurs satellites et plusieurs lancements pour réaliser une mission complètement équivalente. On parle, on parle de quelle technologie de la propulsion Alors on parle effectivement de la propulsion électrique qui permet d'économiser de, bah, de la masse euh, pour l'ensemble du satellite. Et la masse qu'on a réussi à économiser, eh bien, ça permet de faire une, une charge utile plus grosse, plus capacitive et qui a euh, ce niveau de performance totalement euh, inégalé. Et d'ailleurs, en fait, un des utilisateurs hein, ou une des applications clés de ce satellite, ça va être les communications à bord des avions, des avions de ligne. Et euh, justement, nos collègues de Thales Avionics vont pouvoir offrir un service exceptionnel à partir de ce satellite hein, qui s'appelle Flight Live by Thales hein, et euh, qui offrira à bord des avions, donc euh, non seulement on va dire l'entertainment à bord, hein, comme on a l'habitude de voir, les, je dirais les images ou les, euh, les vidéos, mais également euh, une communication comme si vous étiez à terre, comme si vous étiez dans votre bureau ou, euh, ou chez vous. Donc on parle de satellites, c'est des choses qui pour le commun des mortels peuvent paraître, des technologies qui peuvent paraître très loin de nous, alors qu'en fin de compte c'est je vais pouvoir utiliser mon téléphone dans l'avion demain grâce aux satellites que vous envoyez. Absolument, c'est exactement ça. En quoi aujourd'hui Thales Alenia Space est devenu un acteur incontournable en matière de satellites de télécommunications commerciaux Depuis plus de 30 ans, en fait, Thales Alenia Space est dans le trio de tête des, euh, des constructeurs qui proposent des satellites géostationnaires. Au-delà de ça, il n'y a pas que les satellites géostationnaires dans les télécoms, il y a aussi ce fameux sujet des constellations dont on parle énormément en ce moment. Et Thales Alenia Space est vraiment, je dirais aujourd'hui, l'acteur industriel majeur de ce domaine puisque c'est nous qui avons réalisé toutes les, euh, les constellations de, de communication qui sont en service commercial aujourd'hui. Et puis on est présent dans le domaine des, des satellites de communication militaire, donc là c'est euh, vraiment à des fins de communication ultra sécurisées sur le champ de bataille, et on est en particulier euh, le, le partenaire de référence à la fois en France, mais également en, en Italie. Donc euh, ça nous emmène naturellement sur euh, le projet euh, Syracuse, le deuxième passager euh, qui sera à bord ce soir, Syracuse 4A. Quels ont été les défis dans la construction de ce satellite alors un des premiers défis, c'est que Syracuse 4A remplace son prédécesseur qui s'appelait Syracuse 3, ça paraît assez logique, mais euh, on doit assurer une compatibilité complète entre les deux systèmes. Et ça, c'était euh, un premier niveau de, de défi. L'autre point, c'est qu'on parle de satellites militaires et donc ces satellites sont euh, exposés ou doivent être capables de faire face à des menaces euh, de toutes sortes, hein, y compris euh, une menace type nucléaire, euh, mais également des menaces en matière de, de cybersécurité ou de cyberattaque. Hein, et donc à ce titre, Syracuse 4A est un satellite hyper résilient contre ces menaces de, de, de cyberattaque. On, on bénéficie, je dirais, de la très grande compétence de Thales dans le domaine de la, de la cyber qu'on applique à, à, ces, à ce satellite Syracuse 4A. On a un défi autour de la souveraineté, c'est-à-dire qu'il faut faire un satellite de manière autonome en utilisant les industriels et les technologies françaises. Juste avant de regarder le, le départ de la fusée, le décollage, un petit mot sur le futur, les projets 
les grands projets à venir euh, de Thales Alenia Space Alors, Les équipes sont, de Thales Alenia Space sont extrêmement fières de travailler sur des, des objets de très haute technologie. Elles cherchent, je dirais, à toujours repousser les frontières du, du possible, les frontières euh, technologiques euh, en matière d'innovation. Et c'est ce qu'on fait en ce moment en travaillant sur les satellites de nouvelle génération, en préparant l'avenir, que ce soit dans le domaine civil euh, qu'on a couvert aujourd'hui, mais également dans le domaine de la défense. Merci beaucoup. Merci à vous. During this report, Hervé Derry talks to us a lot about sovereignty. Well, it's a term that we hear more and more in the field of energy and data storage. Control of space is also a sovereignty issue for France's defense and national security. Free access to and use of outer space are conditions for the country's strategic autonomy, whether for communication, navigation, observation, identification or information. Space capabilities are necessary for the preparation and conduct of all military operations. But we also know that space has become an increasingly militarized scene of confrontation. What with jamming and espionage are developing and the democratization of access to space is making it a source of rivalry between many state and non-state players, both historical and emerging. So in order to move forward, a new armament program called Mastering Space has been launched. It is made up of two components, surveillance and active defense. France's goal is to better monitor its satellites and in the event of a hostile act to respond in an appropriate and proportionate manner in accordance with the principles of international law. But then, hey, let's get back to Ariane 5. The launcher left Kourou more than 20 minutes ago and during our report, the DD announced what? What did he announce, David? Can you tell us? Yeah, so he announced several things. The, the acquisition of the ground station in Malindi, but also, and more importantly, the, the shutdown of the of the upper stage engine, uh, which, uh, so the launcher has now reached okay. the targeted orbit and uh, we are now going into the next phases to prepare the separation of SES. Phase, yes, the, the next phase, we, as you see in the images, the, the, the launcher is uh, moving and around, turning around to, uh, to put SES-17 in the right position uh, for its separation. This, uh, this separation should take place in a couple of minutes now. But in also less than five minutes, Ariane 5 will put into orbit SE-17, one of the two passengers. This is a key stage of the mission. This six-ton satellite is driven by a powerful fifth-generation digital processor, the DDP. It will be able to process 100 times more data than the previous generation and will enable governments to accelerate their policies to reduce the digital divide in America. So just before the launch of this satellite, which is the 164 satellite designed by Thales Alenia Space and launched by Alenia Space, the DDO should also announce the loss of Libreville. Can you explain? Yes, we are now, as you see uh, on in the I'm looking map, up now on the right, yeah. In the map, we see that uh, we, are, uh, we have traveled across Africa and uh, we are continuing into the, to the Indian Ocean. And uh, therefore, yes, we, we have lost uh, the Libreville station, which is on the west coast of Africa. It's incredible all the journey um, Ariane 5 has done. So we're waiting for the separation of SES-17. And what does this step represent for all the teams? This must be very another a crucial phase for your client. Yes, this is a quite intense moment. The, the separation is a very important milestone for, for SES and for Thales Alenia Space teams, of course, uh, and also for us at Arena Space. It is the culmination, David, of how many years of work? Well, it's the result of many years of, of studies, manufacturing, integration and tests for, for each one of these satellites. And for us on the launcher side, we have also performed uh, analysis uh, during uh, several years to, to define and validate the mission and to prepare all the details. So David, in less than 10 seconds, we're going to see the separation of SES-17, which we've all been waiting for. You can see everybody waiting with bated breath in the fishbowl, in the control center, Jupiter's control center. Here we go. You can see it now coming up on the screen, David. Right, yes, we have. Separation du satellite SOS-17. We have the confirmation brilliant. now. Brilliant. That is brilliant news. Everyone's looking very smiley behind their masks. So that's the news. What is the news then? We've got the separation is confirmed. That's correct. And so now our, our customers, SES and Thales Alenia, will very soon be in contact with the satellite 
and they will start the, the orbital maneuvers uh, as soon as possible. We already noticed in the previous Road to Space that at this stage the mission, the teams aren't completely rejoicing, they're not completely relaxed. Can we say though that this separation was a success even though there's not smiley smileys? Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, reaching the orbit is, is a major step for them. It's, uh, it's the start of the satellite operations in space. Um, as I said, the, the, the teams will establish contact with the satellite within 30 minutes and, and will deploy, will start deploying the large solar panels of SES-17. And in the coming hours, the, the, the plasma engines will be ignited to start climbing to, to the final orbit. What are the next uh, phases? Can you talk to us about that? What are we, you will be looking forward to? Yes, yeah, so uh, right now, as, as you see in the uh, image to the right, the, there is uh, the main stage, uh, sorry, the upper stage, and then the, the SILDA, the double launch structure that is still covering the, the lower passenger, Syracuse 4A. So in the coming minutes, there will be uh, maneuvers that will be performed to separate uh, the SILDA structure uh, prior to the separation of the, of the Syracuse uh, satellite. So what kind of speed is it going at now? Well, right now, as you see down in the screen, we're at a speed of uh, 8.5 kilometers per second, and we are climbing up. Uh, the altitude is uh, increasing rapidly, as you can see. We are right now at uh, seven. So how se far is it climbing? How quickly? Well, you can see that basically it's uh, going up uh, by a few kilometers per second. As you can see on the right, we are right now at 1,830 kilometers and, and going up fast, yes. So. So whereabouts are we? If we look back on the map, we yeah, now if we look are at the still map, over the Indian Ocean. Right, we are on the Indian Ocean, and uh, what we mentioned before, as you can see in the simulation, we are now, uh, the sun is rising in the Indian Ocean, which means that the satellites will be able to get sunlight very quickly. Which, is, which was important, as an important factor, which is why we have um, launched off so late tonight. Can you That's tell us that? That's correct. That's correct. That's the reason we launched late, so they could have sunlight uh, very quickly after their uh, release from the launcher. Well, I think we're close to sunlight here in Paris in over <laughs> two hours. It's um, 4.42 here in Paris. It's quite late here. And we're now waiting um, for, well, the, se the SIL, the separation, and also the separation of our satellite Syracuse 4A, which we'll be looking forward to, because that will, once that happens, what happens? Y yes, well, once, uh, w of course, once the, uh, the, the second satellite is separated, then the the stage, the upper stage, will, will begin its uh, passivation uh, and its end-of-life uh, maneuvers to, to, to make it come back down uh, as much as possible and reduce the, the lifetime in orbit. So, for example, when we're in the Jupiter um, control room, what kind of, what are we feeling at this moment? You know, is it, it's still obviously very, very tense. Yes, that's right. For the first uh, customer, SES-17, I would the say customers, yes, they exactly. are they're a bit relieved because the, the, the separation has taken yeah. place. But of course, for the second ones, they are still waiting for these important moments, which are the, the see separation. see a lot of people um, who are rubbing their foreheads. Yes, yes, everybody uh, is waiting in patiently for the last uh, events to take place, yes. So can you, who, who are we seeing now on So the here we have uh, some uh, customer representatives uh, from uh, Syracuse 4A. Uh, we have... Uh, How can you recognize them? Well, usually they have, uh, you can see the small labels their in logo. front. Okay. Yes, okay. and their logos. Um, so they all seem to be Here we have the, the mission directors, uh, Thierry Fahem and... Uh, Christophe Besnard, who are the, the mission directors uh, for the, who are the Ariane space representatives uh, for these uh, for these uh, two satellites, together with uh, the satellite customers uh, next to them. They seem to be looking up. They're looking up at the screen, obviously. Yes, they are following uh, the last moments. 
Yeah, we have some other uh, customer representatives. This was as the well. amphitheater we talked about earlier, was it not? That's correct, yes. So there's a huge screen in front of them, they're watching the images live. That's correct. Everyone looks very, very serious and very, very focused. Yes, and we should have the, the separation of the SILDA structure coming up in, the DDO, will he be telling in less us that? than one minute. Yes, we will indeed get the confirmation from the DDO in around 40 seconds. Around 40 seconds. So we can still see um, the launch out on its trajectory. Yes, we can see the SILDA structure, uh, the black structure on top of the, of the stage. Great it is we did have that green panel tonight after that little worry before with the red. Yes. Um. You see the sun coming up. So where are we? We're still above the Indian Ocean. So now so now, yes, we At have... 36 minutes and 21 seconds, we should be getting the... Uh, oh, here we go. Right. David, what is happening? There we go. We have now the confirmation of the separation of the structure, of so the SILDA structure, okay. yes. So can you remind us of the function of this important element in the Ariane 5 fairing? Yes, it's, uh, it's indeed a, a, a very important structure that allows to to do these uh, launches with two customers at the same time. Uh, it's a, a carbon fiber structure, uh, a very strong structure. It's, uh, its weight is uh, less than 450 kilos, but it can withstand loads of uh, more than 20 tons. So it's a, a very efficient, very strong uh, structure. So do you have any further information from the CVI? Um, obviously, tension has not yet subsided. Can you explain to us why? Well, it's uh, again because we are still waiting for the last uh, separation. Everything is uh, moving forward as uh, as expected. Um, very good news. Yes, very good news. And as you see, we are now turning. Uh, the launcher is turning to put um, S uh, sorry Syracuse for uh, A in the uh, right uh, position for its separation. So we've been together on Road to Space for just over an hour now. In a few minutes, the Ariane 5 launcher will be separating from the second satellite, Syracuse 4A, and put into orbit. This separation will mean that all the teams can, I imagine, finally celebrate the end of the mission and relax. What do you think, David? Yes, that's right, yes. And are all separations the same, or do they have their own specificities and challenges? They're obviously not all identical. No, you're right, Emma. Each separation is a bit different. The, we have uh, been an, the, the separation has been analyzed precisely to put the satellite in the required uh, orientation. We got the confirmation that the right orientation has been reached. And therefore, we should have a separation uh, in a few seconds. The DDO, sorry to interrupt you. In, de in 10 seconds, sorry, we're going to be announcing the DDO is going to be announcing the separation of Syracuse 4A, which is obviously a crucial moment. That's right, yes. Here we go. Looks like it's separating. Yes, we you have. Separation uh, Syracuse 4A. Applause. We go. can hear the applauses in the Jupiter control room. That's fantastic. Yes, the separation. They must be so happy. Look at those smiles on those faces. Well, I think, thank you, David, so much for that. Look, there's applause all around. They must be very, very relieved. That's right. And in a... So now their life, satellite's life, begins in space. That's correct. The launcher has finished its job. It's up to the satellites now. It's up to the satellites now. Well, we're now going to be linking up soon. We're going to be connecting with Stefan Israel. We can't wait to hear his uh, first reactions. He must be so relieved that the launch has been a success. And of course, my colleague, Baptiste, 
Um, he will be interviewing him and I will be uh, interpreting um, in English in, for all our English language audiences. And I'd like to thank everybody who stayed up so late to be with us. It's now 10 to 5 Paris time. I imagine in London, 10 to 4, and in Kuru, well, it's late. But we, David, a last word before we hear Stefan Israel? Well, no, thank you, Emma, for inviting me tonight, and it's been a, thank you a for pleasure. Helping. Thank you for explaining everything to us so wonderfully, and for living and experiencing the launch. As I said in a minute, we will be linking up with Stefan Israel. We're just waiting. Obviously. So now all the yeah, it's just uh, so the, what, what, all the satellite now? teams are uh, now uh, establishing contact with their satellites from the, the their ground stations, the, the satellite ground stations. And uh, yes, you see in the picture some of uh, the customers from SES, and they are in. So, how long will they be staying there? Will they be staying there in the control room for quite a while? No, usually they should have the confirmation from the, their ground stations uh, within a few minutes, maybe up to half an hour at the latest. So, they quite a lot of people in the um, amphitheater tonight. Yes. But no one's allowed to move. What are they waiting for? Well, they're, they're waiting again for the, the satellites, uh, the customers to confirm that they have ac oh, okay. established a contact with their satellites. How long does it take normally? It's, uh, it's a matter of, uh, of minutes, a few minutes. And, and how will we know? Will we see just suddenly? Um, I, I, I'm sure we'll get the information and you will probably see people starting to relax a bit more. I've just heard that Stefan Israel is just putting on a microphone, and so we're waiting to have a last chat with him. He must, as I said, be very relieved that this launch has been such a success after, as we remember, David, the red yes. <laughs> coming up on the green panel. Thirsty work. <laughs> So, as I say, we are still now waiting, and they are still waiting in the Jupiter control room, That's right. waiting to get the okay from the clients. Yes. So, uh, tonight, I'd like to remind you that we've beaten a record. How many records? Three records tonight. Yes, that's right. Three records. We have uh, we had the, the heaviest uh, satellites uh, on board with uh, more than 10.2 tons. Uh, we also had the, the heaviest overall launcher performance, more than 11.2 tons, and uh, the that tallest. That was a really a first. That was incredible. The tallest launcher, uh, the tallest Ariane 5 launcher we've ever launched, and you see here. Ah, so the, here we are. Here we see the images of the launch, which um, broke three records tonight, which David has just been explaining to us what records were broken. The tallest launcher. The tallest launcher. Going to space. The heaviest. The tallest Ariane 5. Ariane 5. Yes. That is quite remarkable. While we're watching these images, um, we're just waiting to have Stefan Israel. As I said, we'll be talking to my colleague, Baptiste, and I will be um, translating to English because obviously he is French. But look at those images. That was something very dramatic. Yes. What do you feel every time you see that? I Certainly I was... Ah, here we are, back again. Into the Jupiter control room. Um, am I wrong when I say it's the fishbowl, or is it just... Yes, that's how we usually call it. That's how you call it. it. Yeah. Ah, here we are. Here we are. So, oui. good evening. Oui, bonsoir. Rebonsoir, plus exactement. Bonjour. We have just seen the smiles all around the control room, Stéphane. <laughs> a, a, a big success tonight. 
Oui, enfin, un succès euh, surtout euh, pour nos clients, euh, pour euh, SES euh, et pour le ministère des Armées, puisque leur satellite... Yeah, well, we're closing the chapter of a long journey that has led us up to this precise moment. It has taken several years of work to prepare this launch, and I would like to thank all the people who made it a success. In the last few minutes before liftoff, all eyes were fixed on the launcher, but we mustn't forget that the launch is above all the result of teamwork, of dedicated and passionate people. I would therefore like to thank the teams from Ariane Espace, Ariane Group, Thales Alenia Space, SES, and the French Ministry of Armed Forces, and especially the French General Armament Directorate. And of course, without forgetting all the team ESAs and CNES. And now, Stefan is now talking about the next launches. Um, he's talking about the next launch will be the James Webb launch, liftoff. The Vega launch, and on the 18th of December, the James Webb launch. Of course, we will be there. We'll be following that launch closely in a couple of months' time. Well, that's a wrap from Karou. Thank you, Stefan. Well done to the teams involved. And thank you so much, David, for being with me here in Paris this morning. Well, it's time to say goodbye from both of us. We'll see you again shortly on the next Road to Space. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. C'est bon, ils ont acquis leur set.